So to start with, um, I'd like to um, offer the floor to um, Anna Abru, um, and forgive my pronunciation, um, who will be talking to us about the protection of civilian sites. Um, and Anna's from the University of San Diego. Um, you can check her profile on um, the CHL conference platform if you would like some more information. But um, Anna, thank you very, very much. I'm really interested to uh, hear what you've got to say. Anna's going to talk for about 15 minutes and then we will hopefully have five minutes for questions. Um, and if we run out of time for questions, then we will um, hold over some questions until the end. So thank you. Um, so hello everyone. Um, it's, I'm sorry. Um, hello everyone, whatever time zone you are in. For me, it's early in the morning. Um, so my presentation today on the protection of civilian sites in South Sudan um, is based on research which started some three, four years ago and was uh, in a way concluded some two years ago. So this um, this conference was for me an opportunity to revisit my thesis, revisit my research, um, um, and, and stay updated, um, up to date with um, new developments in the protection of civilian sites. So what are the protection of civilian sites? Um, one way to define them is as a somewhat recent addition to the protection of civilians toolbox in the context of um, UN peace operations, but with um, significant, uh, but carrying significant um, um, importance um, to humanitarian practice as well. So they developed as ad hoc protection spaces that grew in and around UN military bases when civil war broke. Uh, broke out in South Sudan in late 2013, and thousands of South Sudanese sought protection in UN bases, uh, as there was already a mission stationed there. So in many ways, protection of civilian sites are uncharted territory, the guidelines for the UN mission, UN MIS, um, in place at the time, uh, limited inside protection to 72 hours, which didn't happen as conflict uh, continued and people wouldn't leave the bases. So these um, makeshift IDP camps were built around UN bases um, throughout the years. Um, for most of the time between 2013 and 2020, there were um, POC sites in five locations. In, in the country, but since uh, September last year, the UN has started the process of transitioning those POC sites into um, traditional IDP uh, camps. And the transition has been concluded in three of those sites. There are two that are uh, awaiting transition or in the process of transition. One of those is the Bentiu POC site, which is the largest one and has has now and has always had uh, for most of, it, of its existence, um, a population just around 100,000 people. So these are basically small towns that are um, managed by the UN and by humanitarian actors. Um, I say that these, are, these spaces are transitioning into IDP camps because the POC sites are very particular spaces in at least three essential ways. First, security. Um, is not provided by the state in POC sites as they are in refugee and IDP camps. And IDP camps. Um, it is precisely because the state uh, security forces were part of the conflict in South Sudan that the UN bases became privileged spaces of protection as they are considered inviolable. Um, and you know, state security forces cannot enter uh, um, UN bases without UN authorization, but also the fact and then the second aspect is that um, the fact that these uh, are military bases make these camps militarized spaces. Uh, so where generally um, IDP or refugee camps would be managed and, and the highest authority in there would be um, humanitar the humanitarians um, under CCCM coordination, camp coordination and camp management, uh, the camp coordination and camp management cluster. 
um, would be the highest authority. In this case, um, it is the UN mission, even though humanitarians are an integral part of the camp. Um, early on in, in the development of the POC sites, uh, a roles and responsibilities memorandum agreement was um was developed so um the um, it was decided that the un mission would be responsible for perimeter uh, security and law and maintaining law and order inside the camps while the humanitarians would be responsible for the delivery of way of aid and coordination of that delivery um and the third aspect is that um Precisely because of this co-location between humanitarians and peacekeepers, there are two protection rationalities, protection of civilian rationalities at work in the POC sites. Um, one that is security centered, which is the peacekeeper uh, rationality and which focuses on um, physical security and preventing violent death, and the other, the humanitarian, focusing on the upholding of rights and sustaining the processes of life. And it is relevant uh, to, to understand the POC sites and the dynamics between these two rationalities of protection in the POC sites. One, because they have created a precedent and lessons from the POC sites in South Sudan can inform future practice, but also because um, of that co-location, precisely because of that co-location between humanitarians and peacekeepers, they are privileged spaces for understanding the discourse of protection of civilians in armed conflict as it is articulated and operationalized by humanitarians on the, on the one hand and by peacekeepers on the other. So um, I have mentioned the ways in which those spaces are unique spaces, but um, Despite the language of exceptionalism, meaning sing singularity and unchartedness being central to uh, UN and humanitarian discourse on the POC sites, it is the idea of exceptionality um, in the sense of suspension of the rule or, or of the law that is the element of continuity between the POC sites and more established well-known spaces. And this is what I want to bring attention to. I'm, I'm here dialoguing primarily with a critical literature on camps um, and, you know, mainly refugee camps, IDP camps, but also spaces designated for the containment of migrants that builds on Giorgio Agamben's concept of camps as spaces where exception becomes the rule and sovereign power manages bare life, a form of life that is stripped bare, so to speak, of political, juridical, and theological subjectivity, and this itself caught in the zone of indistinction between inclusion and exclusion in the juridical order, between law and non-law. Um, the protection of civilian sites have been marked um, by the perpetuation of emergency measures, and um, this has produced um, many tensions between peacekeepers and humanitarians because most humanitarian uh, standards of camp uh, of camp um, management and camp, camp organization have not been uh, observed. Um, these include, you know, minimum space per inhabitant, number of latrines per, per number of inhabitants, um, the, the, the peacekeeping operation refusing in some instances to dig boreholes um, just so the spaces wouldn't uh, acquire this, uh, what was deemed a more permanent aspect. And this led to the deterioration of quality of life uh, in the protection of civilian sites. But besides these instances of irregularity, there were instances of uh, illegality or exceptionality, uh, including indefinite detention. And it was very interesting um, that even indefinite detention was um, justified as a means of protecting. So uh, violating or suspending rights in order to protect lives or pro protect rights. So all this points to a situation of irregularity um, um, related to, a to the perpetuation of um, the temporality, temporality of emergency in the POC sites. Um, this situation of protracted emergency has produced an environment that is insecure in more than one sense, not only due to the threat of violence uh, looming around the, the sites, but also due to the lack of prospects and quality of life. So in order to understand this 
um, dynamic in the POC sites. I found in the um, in the the concept of police power an important analytical tool. And I'm here going back to Foucault's genealogical reconstruction of um, police power when he talks about the this emergency uh, the emergence in in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe of an ensemble of controls and techniques and interventions. Um, focused on um, controlling the processes of living and more than living. Um, and, and considering this earlier development of police as concerned with living and more than living with the processes of life at the level of the population and the more contemporary security-centered formulation of police power as the upholder of, of law and order, we can find here uh, that both humanitarian and peacekeeping um, roles, uh, um, um, uh, roles inside the POC sites were to a certain extent um, different forms of police work. And as Mark Doucet notes, even if um, it operates primarily through regulatory power or as in, in Foucauldian terms, governmental and biopolitical power, police power also retains the discretionary prerogative to decide on the exception to the law, which is a characteristic of sovereign power. In the POC sites, we see the humanitarian actors operating primarily through regulatory power and the peacekeepers uh, circulating through these three modalities of power, biopower, governmentality, and sovereign power. One of the consequences of understanding protection work as police work is that because of this intimate relationship between police power and exceptionality, the civilian who is protected and, and policed at the same time is also reduced to bare life because protection of civilians is embedded in a rationality of police and because police can decide the, on the exception, the normal rules that dictate the relationship between power and human life do not apply to the relationship between protectors and protected, between subjects who protect and objects of protection. Um, as an analysis of the POC site suggests, the combination of this police rationality with a temporality of emergency creates political and discursive space for the opening of a spatiality of exception. This doesn't mean that exceptional practices will take place, but the lifting of guarantees is of central importance here. This absence of guarantees is integral to the DFSN's understanding of humanitarian government as based on a relation of inequality occupied as it is with the government of precarious lives, which he describes as lives that are not guaranteed, but bestowed in answer to prayer. And now if I have, if I still have time, yeah, I do still have time. Um, I want to draw some, not some conclusions, but some um, further implications of this um, assessment of the POC sites. So, um, okay, um, I, I, can, I can finish in, in, in two minutes. Um, um, what the broader implications of this critical assessment of this of the POC sites are. Um, unfortunately, I don't have lessons learned, learned or substantive proposals to offer, um, but I have a few thoughts. Um, in peace building manuals, we read a lot about reflective practice. And while I support the idea and hope to be able to be a reflective practitioner, um, the critique that I I I, I hope to have been able to expand in this presentation um, is that reflective practice at, at, an, at an individual level is not enough here. The wider discourse or discourses of civilian protection have at their core and foundation a union dimensional depiction of protected bodies and protected populations as helpless victims. And this is not limited to protection of civilians discourse, for example, Makamutua will make a similar and very poignant criticism in relation to international humanitarian law, uh, in, international human rights law. Um, and, and this leads to a relation of inequality 
between protected and protector, be it the peacekeeper, humanitarian, or other uh, protect protection actor. And that leads to the reduction um, of, of protected lives to what Agamben calls bare life or what, to, what um, Didier Fassan uh, calls precarious life. So there is a call here for um, a reworking at the level of foundations, underlying assumptions, doctrines, policies, strategies, and practice. So reflective practice alone would not, in my opinion, be a solution to these kinds of unequal uh, practices. Thank you very much.